sit. So this is a $400 a month home. And Lauren, can I ask you, did you furnish it yourself or did no. you did? Because yep. some of these you can rent, but it's a lot more, right? If it's already furnished. You don't want the furniture. You, yeah. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. You're so liable for it. They call it uh, furnished. There's a card table with two chairs that's furnished. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to walk through. I'm going to take the garbage out. Um, you can go right on up. It's a really modern kitchen here. It's an oven. This is the uh, kitchen that you see his YouTube videos in. <laughs> him cooking. It's a little, a little on the dirty His little cooking videos. We'll go up the stairs here now. Beautiful. I love the wood, staircase. Wood staircase. I'll be right back. All right. Yeah, I don't know how many bedrooms. There's another bedroom here. Three bedrooms and a loft. Here's wow. another bedroom. Another bathroom wow. here. And there, and there's another loft. Here's a bedroom here. And this looks like his, this is his production area. And another loft with a bathroom. This is, I'm guessing, uh, this is where he does his video production over here. Wow, and another level up here. Incredible. All of this for 400 a month rent. Can't argue with that. Beautiful place. All right, hello everybody. Jim Paris here, ChristianMoney.com. And I want to introduce you to my new friend. His name is Lauren David. And I met him originally through YouTube. He has a YouTube channel. And his YouTube channel I found to be, let's say, refreshingly honest about living overseas, especially here in Ecuador. There's a lot of people making a lot of money by making it sound like living in Ecuador is perfect without any problems, without any issues. It's nice and there's so many pluses, but it would be fair to say there are a lot of minuses as well. And Lauren has been uh, very honest with his representation of what's here. We've been here now a week. I can agree with everything he said about the pluses and the minuses, even though I've only been here as a tourist. His YouTube channel, you can find it by searching for Gran Colombia. Well, right? it, it's still under the old name Cuenca, Ecuador. Okay, so it's still under Cuenca, Ecuador, but I'm going to put a link in the description here, in the video description, to make sure you can get uh, to his channel. So, Lauren, uh, welcome. Good to have you with us today. Glad you're with us. Um, so, start by telling me uh, your backstory. So, obviously, you're an American. How did you end up here in in Cuenca, Ecuador? Just the Reader's Digest. Okay. Thing. How many years have you been here? I worked what? my whole life. Right. And I got sick. I got cancer. Oh, okay. And sure, I was sure. pronounced to die. And uh, for a number of years, for two and a half years, I actually had to stay in bed. Wow. It's, I blew up like a balloon. And then, it's a story in and of itself. Um, it was a miracle, so they claim. All the lymphatic cancer disappeared after an operation on my ear. Oh, wow. Which had nothing to do with it. Wow. But when they ran the, uh, the CAT scans yeah. with the radiation, uh, everything came back gone. Wow. So they ran all the tests again, then it came back gone. You can edit it out if it's too long, but I'll try to make it short. Sure. I'm in the VA hospital because all the... This is back in the United States. Back in the United States. Where is this? Where were you in? Well, I was in Durham for the VA hospital okay. in North Carolina. Okay. And um, they hadn't been able to find the problem. They ended up going to the VA hospital hoping they could find it. Um, I had to stop working because I would fall down. I would have these effusive nosebleeds, I mean, wow. gushers and... A lot of issues, so that's why I end up in bed because I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't stand. I just fall, and it was dangerous. So anyway, I'm in the VA hospital, and they figure out cancer, and there was in my middle ear, and that's what was affecting my balance. So I go to this lab technician, and there was nobody else around, and she's to run my first test uh, to locate everything, isolate it. And so 
this being a military hospital, being government, she goes in the other room to prepare the radiation, whatever it is. She comes back in and she asks, would I mind if she prayed? So it, it seems strange in a military, I, I don't care. <laughs> right, right. Not, not hurt anything. <laughs> I didn't expect it. what happened. She took my hand and for about five minutes, she's out loud, you know, talking. So when she was done, I said, isn't that dangerous here? And she says, oh yeah, I could lose my job. And why would you do that? Hmm. And do you do this very often? Yeah. And she said, no, I've never done it before. And yeah, I would lose my house and, you know, her family would be in a terrible... Why would you do that? Because people could walk by and over here. Right, right. And she said, when I was preparing this, I heard God tell me to go pray. Wow. So, okay, whatever. You know, it's like, I, I'm... I'll accept whatever you want to believe, you know? Right, right. So we run the test, and then we they scheduled the operation for my ear, uh, but they said that I was going to die. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, they do the operation, and I did die. It was supposed to be about a 30, 40 minute operation. I was there for about four hours. Apparently I died uh, when they were trying to bring me back around. <clears throat> but they had me hooked up on things, so I survived without brain damage. Mm. And um, no, I didn't see a white light. <laughs> I actually saw absolutely nothing. Um, so this was how many years ago? Uh, three, three years ago. Three years ago. Now, so you had, at that point, you had no, you were not living in Cuenca. No. This, so this, so you're, so after this medical situation is when you decided maybe to move. Not quite, but... Um, Anyway, after the operation, they ran the tests, everything had vanished. Right. They didn't know why. They told me to go back to bed for a couple of weeks. I wasn't about to do that. And so three days later, I was in Quito. Now, it wasn't on a whim. Those couple of years in bed, I had nothing to do. A couple of weeks, you mean? A couple of years in bed? A couple of years wow. in bed. Wow, a couple of years in Two bed. Two and a half years wow. in bed. Wow. I had nothing to do but get fat and sit on the internet <laughs> and decide where I was going to live yeah. once I survived. You know, I know they said I wasn't going to survive, but I didn't believe that. Right, really. right. You're planning. It well, wasn't a matter of denial. Yeah. I, I understood exactly what they're telling me. I lost my brother ten years prior for right. the same thing. Right. So I accepted what they had to say. I just didn't believe it. I didn't. I didn't feel it. So. Uh, where do I want to live? I said, well, Thailand was beautiful. I was there before. I've been to 20 different countries. Okay, so you've traveled a lot. <clears throat> a lot. I've you've lived in three other different. countries. Okay. Uh, so I lived in Japan for three years. I, I, I've been around Asia and Europe and, right. and South America. And, and so I just started eliminating one after another after another. And to be honest with you, I really wanted to go back to Colombia. But when I was there last, I lived there for a short period of time, I was shot at. It was kind of the Wild West. Okay. It, was, it was when the FARC still existed, which so were just criminals. Right, the stories we hear about, like, Colombia is run by all the drug lords and all that, that is a little bit true. It, At least it was back it then. It was true then. Right. It was a very dangerous place. Over half of the population were unemployed. The wow. economy was in the tank. Bombs would go off. It was... Wow. But at the time, you know, I was strong. And I didn't care. I didn't you were, mind. You were looking for, for a little adventure. It didn't. It just didn't bother. <laughs> it didn't phase me. Right. But now that I'm, you know, I'm fat and I'm tight, weak and no muscle tone and, you know, because I've been in bed, I'm thinking, I, I can't handle that. You're not ready to be a star of an adventure movie. Yeah. It's <laughs> like I, before I could handle it, I, I couldn't. I knew I physically I couldn't handle right. it. Right. So I, I think I love Colombia so much. What would be close? Ecuador is next door. Border country. Right? What I didn't know at the time is Ecuador and in Colombia are about as close as Japan and Canada. Okay. You know, they're just right. nothing nothing you mean, alike. You mean like they're geographically close, but they're not S society you know the social. I'm gonna tell our ask our producer Ann who's off camera. Can you just keep a little eye on our shot and make sure that we're both in the sound <coughs> and everything's working well? And so you you experience Colombia. Then you experience Ecuador. Yeah. And, and, and tell us what, 
You felt like it was a little bit uh, more appropriate? And night and day is, you know, uh -huh. a, that's a phrase for a reason. You know, so, so you were comparing Colombia with Ecuador, and I should also say that Ecuador isn't one thing. In my experience, because when I was in Guayaquil a few days ago, it was like, wow, this is, this is like a Spanish-speaking New York City. Maybe not as nice, but <coughs> then there's Cuenca, which is more of a small town feel to me anyway. Yeah. So you decided, based on everything going on in your life, Cuenca, Ecuador would be better for you. Well, like most people, if you're going to make a move, you make your list of what's important to you. Right. And believe it or not, number two on my list was mosquitoes. <laughs> I, I, I despise them. Right. You know, if, if it wasn't for mosquitoes... I, I, there's no mosquitoes here, right? No. I mean, I, I don't think I've had one mosquito bite. Well, I've, I've seen flies, but not mosquitoes. Over the course of three years, I've probably seen two or three mosquitoes. Wow. I think they get blown up by the wind. I'm in Florida. I see two or three mosquitoes per second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, I, I can't live like that. I mean, it, you end up in the house all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's just not worth fighting all the time. So uh, that was an important thing, and this, you know, this is like that. Um, now, there's a lot of, I, I have the video that I'm working on right now, the four myths about Cuenca, Ecuador. Right, right. And, um, and people can find out, just so that you know, folks, if you go to his channel, you're going to get a lot more information uh, than what we're able to cover today because we only have, you know, one, you know, chance to sit here and, and chat. But and there's I'm, hundreds of videos. Let there. me ask you, though, this is the one big question I think that a lot of people have is, so um, you, may, you make the decision that you're going to move. So... What then, what then happens? Do you just like get rid of everything that you had in North Carolina? You just like have a big garage sale, everything's gone except maybe a small backpack or two or, or, or uh, luggage or two and you move here and start all over again? Is I that sold it lock, stock and barrel. I bought uh, two really good Samsonite ultra expensive bags yeah, yeah. that I knew that I could get on the airplane. And then I, I spent time going through my things before the operation. I was really planning this, yeah. not knowing if it would ever happen, but right. you got to plan it, right? right? So, you know, what are the most precious things? I had to keep cutting it down, cutting it down. It took several months. The hardest thing for me were books. Yeah. You know, they weigh a ton. They take a lot of space. But there's some I just couldn't part with. And yeah. I've always surrounded myself with a lot of books. Right. And so I cut it down to about 12 books. Wow. That was the hardest. <laughs> that would be the hardest thing for me. It took forever. Yeah. And uh, most of them I'd actually read, but they were so dear to me. Good that books just, to keep. Yeah. And did you just like, some people would keep maybe like a, a storage locker back in the States or a family keeping their thing, the whole life into two suitcases. And you came here to Cuenca, Ecuador. And did you... Did you buy a home here, or did you decide you were going to rent here? No, I knew better than to to buy. Um, you don't know what's going to be permanent, and, right? And I had well, that's what I hear is it's better to rent here. It, well, it's foolish to buy. Yeah, because um, you don't know the future, right? You don't know. Well, it's not just that. Um, you can think that place is where you want to live. And then in three months, you find out all the reasons that you would never want to live there. Yeah. It's a little like late then. Like where I'm at right now, in which is right in downtown Cuenca, which is really cool because my wife and I, we can like walk right out our door and go to multiple restaurants. The churches are all here to see all the things. But it's so noisy. I wouldn't want to live here. I hear the horns. <coughs> the horns are beeping all night. The, beep, the music is playing until midnight, you know. So I get what you're saying, you know, about all that. One of the curiosities, though, is what it would cost to live here. And I know I love your videos because it seems like there's a lot of people making money by making it sound like you can live here for nothing. Yeah. Like it starts with you can live for a thousand dollars a month. Then it start. Then it goes. No, no, you can live here for five hundred. No, you can live here for three hundred a month. Yeah. And before you know it, you publish just for fun. A video that said you could live in Cuenca, Ecuador, for zero, and the, you're you're being you know funny because 
that's, there would be people that would believe that, maybe. They would look at that headline and say, wow, I can live somewhere for zero. Hey, uh, so I want to talk about the Americans because I go into this Sunrise Cafe. Everyone around me is speaking English. They're talking about the, the U.S. hockey teams. And no one's talking about politics, though. That was refreshing. No Trump, no Hillary, well, none there's, of this stuff. There's lots I, of I didn't hear much of that, but... It almost seemed like they won't do it face to face. Okay, I almost, but I almost felt like uh, Lauren, like, where am I? Am I like, am I still in Ecuador? Because people are ordering uh, American omelets, burgers, and burgers, burgers, and all this American food, and the sweet like people, you know, maybe like seventy, age seventy to a little bit older. Um, everybody gets a hug and a kiss from. Frank, the waiter, and Orlando, the cook, comes out and talks to you. Uh, everybody speaks English to all the workers there. Um, so some Americans have really found a wonderful life here, it looks like. And um, I wonder, uh, how did it happen that it's Cuenca? Like, it's almost become like a thing now. Like, like the, we, we went to a jazz club here on Sunday night, and we run into the, the band leader, is a graduate of Eastman School of Music. Uh, his contemporaries at the time were Chuck Mangione, the trumpet player. Uh, he's, well, they're all from Rochester, New York. Yeah, right? yeah, he's 75 years old, a band leader. His name is Jim Gala. And they're doing all this American jazz. And we're sitting in there. And there's all these Americans listening to American jazz. We're eating spaghetti and drinking wine. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is I mean, I almost feel like I could be in America inside of Cuenca in some ways. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a group of people, and I don't know the number, I'd say 100 maybe, that are here that created their own bubble. And they don't bother to learn Spanish. They stay within their bubble. They go from their apartment to Sunrise, Sunrise Cafe, Cafe <laughs> and to, <laughs> to the Jazz Club. And to the Jazz Club, <laughs> San Sebastian Cafe. <laughs> few particular places right <clears throat> and they don't venture out of that and you know there's a lot of judgment on them I could care less hey if that what's make them fine well that's what we in America, I don't feel Americans we're upset with the immigrants that don't assimilate yeah. and then we come here and we don't assimilate yeah well yeah there's some truth to that except these people are all retired so they're not in the workforce. And right. I think that's where it makes a difference. Sure, sure. If you're in the workforce and you're going to demand that everybody change to you, it's pretty unrealistic. <laughs> you know, I, I don't see, you know, demanding that they put English on all the, you know, textbooks. Right. And, right. But if you're retired, then all you're doing is spending money and you're not affecting, you know, the, the local population. So I, I see no purpose in that. I, or, or, I see no problem with that, and I don't want to be judgmental with them because what do I care? It's their life if they're happy with that. I would never be happy with that. It would be too isolated. And to me, it would be like living in some old folks' home right? where you never step outside of the bingo game on Wednesday. Because if you learn how to speak Spanish, then you could get into a whole new culture. Or even if you don't, and, and again, I don't recommend this, but when I came here... I, I didn't really start speaking Spanish until about a year ago. So for a couple years, I was here similar to you. I don't care. I'll just venture out and I'll, I'll muddle through it. And if it takes me a, a lot of time or a mistake, or then I just deal with it. Yeah, it's an adventure. I don't recommend that, as I've said several times now. But it's fine for me. And I would drown if... All I had to look forward to is breakfast on Monday, and you know, <laughs> and the bingo and the game, club. and the jazz club. And tell me about Green. I don't even go to the, most of those places ever, I, except Sunrise Cafe. Yeah, you know, I like to go there once good, in a while. Good way to connect. Oh uh, no, I don't go to connect. Just, I go because he has really good food. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> so tell me about Gringo Landia, which I've heard about, which we haven't been there yet, but we maybe want to try to go down there before we leave is a like a neighborhood where it's all Americans mostly and there are they like high rise apartments? Yeah, but it's not mostly all Americans. It's not, okay. There's a there's an inflated sense of of 
who people are here. Because we're Americans, somehow we're special. And because there's 3,000 of us here, we have this big effect on a city of 600,000. <laughs> If, if they relied, So that's really the number 3,000? I, yeah. I, I imagine it was much bigger than that. 3,000 total gringos, which would be Europe, and et cetera, yeah. is about 6,500 in okay. Cuenca. Uh, from the United States, it's just over 3,000. So that's a tiny... So to call that area Gringolandia is a little bit... They, you see them because they stand out. You know, that you can just, an there's a gringo. An American standing out? What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not in Colombia. <laughs> to, for an American or Venezuelan to come here and become legal to be here. Well, it's very different for an American. I mean, I, I ultimately end up paying $3,000. And if you're coming from Venezuela, you're lucky if you can, you know, put together enough to eat. <clears throat> there's, there's different rules for different people here. So if you have an income and you can prove it in retirement, they want you more so than someone that doesn't have anything. It's it's not so much that. They open the doors for these people who come in from Venezuela, but there's no safety net here. You know, it's funny, We on that video, you can live in Cuenca for zero dollars. Right, right. The only place on this planet I know that you can actually live for zero dollars is the United States. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And these because people, we have all the welfare programs. Yeah. And yeah. They don't have that here. If you come here and <coughs> you have no money, there's no government office to go to to get a. It's exactly right. I was. I go back and forth across the border. I've been to Colombia five times in this past year. And I keep seeing more and more of these people from Venezuela. In one of my videos, I show this family, they're like skeletons. And uh, you see people that look like they're walking dead. They literally look like the old videos from Auschwitz. And um, it's heartbreaking. And something in particular happened that just really got to me. And so I came back and previously, I would help local people find jobs because I have some marketing ability. I decided to see if I could help some people from Venezuela. So I did a video and I posted up um, on a local website to interview people from Venezuela. I talked to dozens and dozens of people and I chose six. And of those six, they, they, they didn't even money for a bus. And I know one of them was even a medical doctor from yeah. Venezuela yeah. who was cleaning houses <coughs> there. A surgeon. Yes, just had to get by to clean houses here. Yeah, so these six people, they're actually all working now. Uh, three didn't have cell phones, which is really tough to have a job if you don't have a cell yeah. phone. They have cell phones, everything that they needed, clothes, warm clothes, you know how cold it gets. They came with beach clothes, you know, because they don't live where it's cold. Right. And so all six are set up. And I was going to continue with it, and as some things that are promised to them are still coming in. It goes to them. But I'm not a saint, and to be perfectly honest with you, it took too much out of me. And so I, I may go for a second round, but I need a break. But you're just kind of... It's can, exhausting yeah, I can imagine dealing that. with that kind of misery. Right. I'm not Mother Teresa. Well, a long-term issue, but someone that's looking to get a job, maybe get you know some education, get a cell phone, some clothing. Uh, but that's that's wonderful. People find out more about that. Uh, but in closing, so an American comes here and they want to retire here. Let's say they they've looked at all the pros and the cons and they want to retire here. Is there a what is the curve to get a visa to be approved to live here? And I know that there's probably no like one answer, but just for the purposes of, of brevity for this uh, interview. Uh, I've heard, well, if you put 25000 in a CD in the bank, that will speed things along. If you have a letter from Social Security or from your pension to show you have X amount of dollars coming in and you pay maybe an attorney here locally or someone to help you, in a few weeks you could be good to go. Is that true? No. 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 Uh, there's different kinds of visas. So you have investment visas, you have uh, work visas and uh, profession um, did I say profession, professional, professional visas, visas right. uh, retirement visas, so there's a number of different types that you may be eligible for. Uh, <coughs> they require 
a crazy amount of documentation. If you were ever married, you have to bring in divorce papers. It could have been 30 years ago, it doesn't matter. And you have to have them certified, you have to have a postille. Everything that you can imagine that you've ever done through the government, all your paperwork, you need records of birth that. certificate. Uh, and it all has to be within six months of you turning that in. Mm -hmm. And so if there's delays, those could be expired and then you have to go back and get them again. Mm -hmm. Getting documentation here, just to have one document from the United States go through that process and arrive on my doorstep was about $300 mm -hmm. for a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, it can be very frustrating. Now, I was under the old laws where I could become a, a permanent resident after everything was processed. But there's a new law that you have to go two years as a temporary resident, and then you have to apply for permanent resident after that. And these things are changing all the time. Depending on what office you go to, it can be different. It can be very frustrating. Ecuador is an over-officious country. They love to stand on ceremony. Titles are very important. They enjoy telling you no. They enjoy exerting their power and having you go to the back of the line so that you can come up and they can tell you no again. Um, so it, it takes sending time. you away. It's going to take time to get yourself approved. Yeah. And do they have people here to help you? Like, a, is Abrogadas, is that an attorney? Is that Abogadis, what you're yeah. That's an attorney. I would highly recommend that you pay the money and get an attorney. It will run you from $1,000, $1,400 for the, for the process. There are people doing it for free, but they're not really for free. Yeah. And they're well spoken of. But there's a reason for that. I, I, I get all the nightmare stories. You can't, there's no freedom of speech here. And so if you speak bad about a business, you can end up in jail or pay a big fine. Hmm. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. So they provide their service. The only thing people can say is positive. <laughs> I hear the other side of the coin. Right. I wouldn't touch them. Right. First of all, they have no legal knowledge. Simply by going and repeating the process over and over, they have their position by virtue of they speak some English. Oh, they speak English, they're going to help me out. Except they don't know what they're doing. And then when the laws change, they're really lost. And when they cause you to spend thousands more than you should have, you can't even tell other people. You can't about even it. like use social media to say I got a bad <coughs> result from this. Um, no. My one last thing is, if you're going to move here, you need to have income from outside of here. Uh, you're not going to move here and get a job or start a business, right. most likely, to be able to develop an income that's based here. The magic of this, the geographic arbitrage, if you will, is. If you have an online business, or like I'm a writer, I've got income from things I write, and, and uh, my wife is a teacher, so she'll have a nice pension, and we'll both have Social Security. So those are scenarios that make sense, but if you think yep. you're going to come here and start a little business, Forget it. or get a job as an American, because no. people make very little here, even, they don't care if you're an American or not, the, the wages or what, like maybe ten or fifteen dollars a day? It's you know, it's it's even worse. Yeah, it, but it's even worse than that. Um, unemployment is very very high. You have a lot of local people that don't have jobs. That's how I ended up originally helping some people try and find jobs. Then you have this influx influx of over four thousand Venezuelans in this past year, all desperate for jobs. On top of it, yeah. <coughs> So the average wage is about 25% of what the legal requirement is oh, okay. because there's so many people willing to work for right. a dollar an hour even. Right, right. And then you have businesses don't even pay them. They'll work them for a month and then just move on to the next one and they keep getting free labor. And nothing gets done about it because who's going to enforce it? So you come here as an American 
what job do you think you're going to get? <laughs> and so, well, I can speak English. Well, there's English right. teachers already here. Well, see, that's what that's what people think. They read these books about retiring overseas. Like, well, you're an American, so you can go over there and you can teach English and you can be an advisor to Americans that are coming. And they're all selling there. something. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and so, so the, no, it's possible. I mean, there are people here in this country that are doing certain jobs. But the chances of it are like, I'm going to be an NFL pro. Yeah, next so, week, so you know? bottom line is your, <coughs> your income would be established you from, better bring it. from outside, which could be an internet business or you're writing books for Amazon or, or those kinds of things. You have a YouTube channel, those are the kinds of things. Lauren, thank you so much for being with us. Um, anything you want to say in closing? Just uh, thoughts for you or uh, information on how people can get in touch with you? Your your uh, different websites and YouTube and all that. Well, you can put all that on your on your thing. I'll put it in the description. When you get to my YouTube channel, you'll find whatever you need, and including email addresses. And and but in any case, uh, a great interview. We thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, Lauren's going to take us now. Maybe we'll get some lunch. He's going to take us to uh, show us some of the you know neighborhoods outside of downtown. And we'll bring the camera along. See where the real people live. Get a little bit of footage over there, too. This is Jim Paris. Goodbye for now. We'll talk to you next time.